Welcome to the 38th DocFest. Um, welcome to the cinema. Welcome to beautiful Silbersaal. My name is Julia Teichmann and I um, introduce films, filmmakers to you if they are there um, since 10 years um, alongside my colleagues. I will talk to the director of Innocence now, Guy Davidi, um, who is with us um, via Zoom. Um, this um, conversation will be recorded and you can see it or you can decide to hear it because we have the doc podcast. Um, you can vote for the audience award when you um, leave the cinema, don't forget this. Or um, if, you, if you want the film to win the audience award, then don't forget this. And um, what else to say? One thing I wanted to say. Um, oh, yes, please, <laughs> if you want to stay tuned for the whole year, um, then uh, 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 think of um, um, getting the uh, DocFest newsletter because we have activities throughout the year um, showing films in um, different cinemas all over the city. That's it, and um, I can see on the screen that Guy Davidi is already with me. I don't know if you can hear me and see me. Guy? Yeah. Yes. Hi. Hi, welcome. <laughs> welcome to Munich. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's nice to see the cinema. It looks very beautiful and special uh, theater. Yeah, it's more like a um, part of the theater, but yes, well, it's just food missing, I said in the beginning, but well. Um, okay. Um, how about to start? Maybe you can tell me, I read that you were working on this film for 10 years, but it seems like you have been working on this um, a lot longer, or let's say, reflecting on this, thinking uh, on this. Um, it's, it's a collage um, from different voices. Um, maybe you can tell me a bit how you, how you found access to the families, because um, this must also be a very painful matter, to, an intimate matter for them. And um, yeah. about the long time working on this. Yeah. Yeah, mm. it, 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 um, yeah it started in uh, 2012 um, when I've decided that the film to tell a film that will be based on this, on diaries and text of soldiers that committed suicide. And um, <clears throat> I have started to search um, to kind of find different stories online in the beginning. And then I realized that it's uh, going to be a very long and very hard task because a lot of these stories are hidden and um, very difficult to find all the information and links about them. And also some of the families that you contact, they either they deny or they get really upset or there's a long process to get their trust um, and security that in my hands and, and also to think about what kind of exposure it's going to bring to them. Um, and diff different opinions within the families about the subject. And, so on. So it has taken me many, many years to, first of all, to pick the stories that are going to be in the film. Um, but I, I have to say, I became a little bit very obsessive about these stories, and I started to contact a lot of families. I've met uh, probably 50 families, and I have covered 700 stories of soldiers who had committed suicide, mostly from the 70s and 80s until nowadays. So I became very obsessive about this to find out more and to learn more about it and to meet more, more to include more as much as possible in the film. And, um, and, um, and so that was a big part of the work. And then the other part of the work was to find out who built this in an interesting and in a special way. I, I, it was important for me that the film will be the perspective of these teenagers. Um, not teenagers or young young people, um, teenagers that turn to become young people, and then. Um, so I didn't want to interview anyone, not to to interview the families, and not to interview uh, experts. And then I have to I had to figure out how I'm going to tell this story as um, as it keeps the spirit of being told from their own perspective. So I came up with this idea of. Um, 
finding stories um, that kind of similar in some ways to how they, to what led them to enroll to the military and put pressure on their life. And I also tried to be more original and to bring a spirit that was very poetic that I found in the diaries by picking uh, stories of a blind soldier and and a young uh, child who has uh, ear uh, issues because it became part of a metaphor about denial and about what we don't see and what we don't hear. Everything came out from the poetry that was uh, in a lot of the poems and the stories. So this was a very hard and long path of building a film and also finding a way that audience like you will accept this film because it's very difficult and dark subject and I really understand why um, people get, you know, people get distant from this because it's uh, just some of the emotions are just maybe too hard to handle. So it was a big effort for me also to find out how to shape it in a way that you could, as audience, process the story and allow yourself to not fully understand and be confused about it, but also accept it. You also try, it's more of a question, but, but um, you seem to also trying um, that we go this path with them, right? Because we lose innocence on the way, also in a formal way. We don't see kindergarten anymore after a while, because in the beginning we always see kindergarten and then it just, yeah. it's over. <laughs> It is a built along the chronology of growing up, so the stories, uh, so we move from childhood into the moment of enrollment. Um, so that, that, that was a way to make us, uh, like, I get the feeling of how it, how it feels to grow up in Israel with this pressure that maybe every scene by itself is not a big thing, but a lifetime of these small events are building a big amount of pressure on us as maybe let's say I speak on, on their behalf, but as um, sensitive people who care for what is happening in our hands. And so it's, um, um, yeah. You don't go to jail anymore in our days when you, when you um, don't enroll, right? But um, I you go, you do? You, well, well, only people it's a question. Are, yeah. <laughs> People who are refusing, like the objectors, um, who make a political case out of their refusal, they go to jail um, still um, all the time. There are right now people in the jail. But these are very specific um, people who are making a, case, a political case from not going to military. And then if you avoid service, like defecting or something like that, then you also go still to jail. Um, but normally, if you want to not do military service, you have to go through a mental, often it will be through a mental um, procedure where you try to get a mental profile, uh, which is a very humiliating process because you, um, not always you're, or sometimes you have a very bad, like, a, I, I went through this process and you're depressed and you're, um, you have m many, uh, emotional, mental issues at that time because you're under so much pressure from being a soldier, from being stripped from your own identity, stripped from your own freedom, um, being forced to be part of violence, even if you're not a combatant. And a lot of pressures are at you at a very sensitive and, and, and fragile age. And so, uh, and then you are forced to go and externalize all this in front of a person that is supposed to be helping you, but he's not really helping you. He's a gatekeeper of the military. He's a kind of a psychologist that is there to determine if you're fit or not fit uh, for the military. And, and his interest, actually, and they are under pressure, is to keep you in the military. So there's no one for you to, to help you, actually. You're very lonely in this process, and it's a very difficult process. But that's the path I have taken, and I've succeeded to go through, go out in that way. But I completely understand, and in many ways, this film is a dedication to all young people in Israel who are just didn't, don't have um, the capacity or w the willingness to be humiliated, also to go through that kind of process. So they pick another option that is there for them, which is terrible, which is the suicide. Um, yeah. 
No, it's also that I um, when you when you when you um, kind of re refuse, like you say, there's no legal way to refuse. You have to go to this process. But it's also like this one girl puts it at one point. You don't fit in, and this is it. It follows you, right, when you stay in Israel. Yes, it, it follows you, but actually, it follows you less than you think it will. As a as a I think as a teenager, because this, uh, most of what you imagine is is actually not truth, and and there's a lot of anxiety about what's gonna what's gonna happen to you and how it's gonna affect your life. I, I mean, it does affect your life. For instance, when I I was 19, when I didn't when I came, I, I did serve for three months and I went out from the military, and one of the one of the events was that I dated a girl, the first kind of girl I met and I had a love story with, and then she discovered I didn't do military service. And on the spot, she dumped me. And, and it was a very sad and humiliating moment for me. And I'm thinking that, for me, I, I've just moved on because I was very kind of pride, um, proud about this. Oh, I, I owned my the fact that I didn't do military service. But I think for other people, this is an unimaginable experience that is terrifying. So it really depends on how you're taking it. Um, but it is mostly this social pressure, how your family are going to react, how the girlfriend, how the people around you, especially around the age of 19, 18, 20, 21. Later in life, less and less. Uh, people don't ask you, what were you doing in the military? And, and I think as Throughout the years, Israel becomes be, uh, became more capitalistic, and well, it's a little bit more accepted to some uh, population not to do military service than it used to be, maybe in the 90s or or 70s or 80s or or even beginning of 2000. But it's still there. It's not. It's just a bit more loose. But I still see stories, very recent stories, that are very close to my my own story. Um, the, the, but these are the kind of pressures, the, the real pressure, like the real, I, I'm, I'm not very limited in what I, could, what I can do. Maybe I cannot work in certain governmental professions and I'm limited in a few things, but, but not much actually. Mm, mm. Um, last question from my side and then um, you are asked to ask your questions. Have you shown your film in Israel so far? Are you premiered in Venice, the Film Fest Biennale in Venice last last year and summer? Um, have you have you shown it already? Well, uh, <laughs> the film is showing in Israel next week. Uh, the this week, uh, no, next week the premiere, Sunday next week. Uh, it hasn't been shown just because of this festival issue that we waited for Dokaviv, which is next week. Um, so for half a year, the film has been going on in different places, and and now it comes to Israel. And to say the truth, I I'm, I'm terrified. I have absolutely no I idea believe. how it will be taken, and it's it's um, yeah, it's it's very stressful because there are so many people involved, and so many emotions, and families, and participants, and, and the general audience, and. Yeah, it's it's interesting for you from the outside. For me, I just want to be on the other side of it. Yeah, yeah. I understand. Yeah. So as I said, um, I'm sure you have many questions. Um, there's a microphone for the audience, I think. Andrea has it. And there's a question. Well, so. okay. Now it's on. Well, first of all, thank you for this very wonderful film. I, I mean, enjoy is probably the wrong word, <laughs> um, but um, yeah, yeah, it really, um, I felt it in a way, I would say. Um, I have a question about the process. Julia was already asking you um, how the whole research started and so on. I would be interested in the films you, in the scenes you filmed yourself, because there is so much archive footage in it. How did you decide how you want to, like, get those in the real scenes? When did you decide what kind of scenes you wanted to show of the children, the military life, and and so on? Um, that would be my first question. Then I found the sound was pretty, um, yeah, obvious, so to say, and I didn't read the credits carefully. I think that you work with a composer, 
or did you like find it somewhere? And you half asked, um, answered my third question already, because uh, I think like is this a topic people speak about in Israel, or is it just something you just not don't don't yeah talk about? Well, thank yeah. you. Um, yeah. Okay. Many questions. Um, when I started the film, I, I had two ideas, actually, of two different films. I knew I wanted to make the film about the suicide and the text from suicide, but I also had this idea to make a film about all the volunteers who are under physical conditions and specifically ones that are connected with senses. Like I imagined, I imagined a scene of a deaf um, teenager is being taken to, or a young person is being taken to the training and being forced to shoot or being told to shoot and maybe he wants to shoot, he is doing the training but he's not allowed to shoot because with the hearing aid you cannot do it and I had this in my imagination and then when I started to do the research we found out about this group of uh, visually impaired and with this blind girl, I thought, well, this cannot be they are taking a blind girl to practice uh, shooting. Which, and this blind girl, by the way, became a big officer in the military. The first blind girl officer. So I had this idea that was separate. And then after I, I read in the diaries, I discovered there's so many references to blindness and deafness and the society that is blind and, um, and this... Um, and this um, this uh, painting of blind uh, people and uh, deaf people, and I thought about this image, and start, decided to merge them. So suddenly there was a visual language that was created just by putting these two together, which was to follow stories and kind of poetic stories with emphasis a little bit about the senses um, in many of the scenes, um, and then more metaphors came along. So. When we casted the 10-year-old girl, um, suddenly we filmed in, a, in her class. We didn't know who we are going to pick. And she told us, this girl, she's riding on horses. So I remember there's so many beautiful texts by Juan about horses that are, for him, an image of freedom and nature and being far away from an, an innocence. And so I said, OK, it has to be this girl. And it was really the chance that this girl was really a girl that was dealing Maybe no chance, because she was connected to a horse, so there is some kind of a natural link there. But that she really felt difficulties with, uh, with the idea of being a combatant at a young age. And, and so there, there was a beautiful kind of uh, journey to find the different links between the, between the text and the visuals and, and picking and the casting and the stories. Um, from the archives we picked, we I tried to work with what we had because it was not easy to find good visual archives of the soldiers themselves. For the archive of the military, the original intention was to film a lot in, in the military and I actually thought a big part of the film would be with characters that are in the military. But the military was really putting difficulties on us to film. So I came up with this idea that we will find archive footage of soldiers filming themselves, which you can find a lot of them in the recent years in YouTube, uh, because um, the military encourages soldiers to share their experiences in the combat. It's part of like to show how fun it is and great it is to be a combatant. So you can go online and find a lot of these GoPro images. And that was the starting point of my journey to find archives on on YouTube and amongst the uh, soldiers who filmed themselves. Um, is, is it not a problem, sorry for intervening, is it not a problem to use them? I mean, to use these? Well, we asked for You, you have to contact. ask all of them, all, okay. yeah. Uh, we have contacted and uh, got their permissions and um, some of them, they didn't know what exactly the film's gonna be, but they got uh, they got paid and they were, okay, use, do whatever you want with it. So. They, will, they will come to the premiere in Tel Aviv, uh, in, yeah, in Tel Aviv. <laughs> Some of them might not, might be, some, no, some didn't care because they say, okay, criticize. A, a lot of uh, soldiers, after they've done military service, they are a little bit more open-minded because uh, they, they know what military is and they've, uh, so they are, maybe can be, can live with some criticism maybe, or at least they think, I, I, I don't know, let's see what's going to happen in two weeks. But, um, for the sound work, uh, we worked with, uh, with a sound designer from Finland, um, 
that is now working for George Lucas. So, so we had a top class uh, sound designer, very creative uh, person that is specialized in folly effect. So uh, we went scene by scene and find the right uh, way to to approach uh, from the sound sometimes to to go into the perspective of the soldier through the sound and um, the music was uh, composed by uh, a relatively young Icelandic composer that I've um, had really the, the honor to work with. Uh, it was a, a very joyful part of the work to find uh, the sounds and the, the, the melodies that fit to, the, to represent this idea of innocence uh, that is being destroyed. Um, of course, I can talk a lot more about that. But, um, yeah, about Israel and the, and the suicide, the third part of uh, your question is that it is some kind of a question, that an issue that everybody knows because everybody knows a story. There's no single person you meet and you talk, tell them about and he doesn't say, I, a friend, uh, someone in my family, or so, and everybody had experienced something connected to how the family reacts or the military reacts and the context. And so people are no, but there's this kind of a quietness around that. And not many articles are coming out. And when they do come out, they have a very um, problematic approach, to my opinion. They focus very much on the psychological aspect. I feel it's an attempt to put the responsibility of the suicide on the person, on their, on their behavior, on their psychology. I don't know if you can hear us, um, Guy, but we lost you, kind of. You're frozen. There you are again. Yeah, sorry. I don't know where I got caught, but... Where are you at the moment? Where are you? Yeah, I'm in Denmark. I don't live in Israel, actually. So... Um, I moved out a few years ago. Mm. You moved out because of what you're talking about in oh, the film? No, no, no. Well, no, not really. I mean, I have... You could say there are connections because I've always imagined that that I will not live in Israel because of all the pressures that you have there. But um, I actually spent most of my life there and I've enjoyed to to be there despite of um, being a, criti a, a person that criticizes it. I enjoy to be part of trying to correct uh, the country. So I didn't, I didn't leave um, from a, for political reasons and I travel often. But what is fully true is that I, I feel much uh, more relieved to, grow, to have a child uh, and not grow it with the idea that he will need to do military or that I will need to prepare him to refuse to do military and all the consequences to be an outsider in this kind of society. And thinking if he's like me or not like me and if he's uh, able to carry all this weight because I don't think I should wish for a child to go through the things I've done, gone through. So. Yeah, many young Israelis leaving the country or living in Berlin. When I was living in Berlin, I was talking to, they were actually referring to this. They don't want their kids to grow up there and to, to um, enlist. Yeah. Um, I, we were interrupted uh, at, a, at a point when you said how the media um, is talking about um, 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 suicide in the army. I think maybe we just wrap this and then <laughs> this is the last question anyways. Yeah, so I, I was saying that a lot of people are uh, aware of this, uh, of the suicide, because everybody knows a story, because it, it's so common that there's uh, every person you ask, he, has, he knows a neighbor, a friend, someone of his family, it's just, it's just all around. So people are exposed to the seriousness of it. And, and the media, many, many years, the media didn't touch it at all. And they were even uh, directly telling uh, journalists, you cannot cover this because it, there is a risk that there will be copies and stuff like that. And during these years, which were most of the years, the numbers of suicides were just crazy big, very, very big. It's the number one reason for death in, in militaries worldwide, by the way. Um, but recently, the last 10 years, it has been going a little bit down. And part of it also that there's a bit more freedom to talk about it. 
But still, often when they talk about suicide, it's to point that it's people who are fragile with mental issues and and uh, has leaningness to commit suicide, depressed and things like like that. And to me, it really is. It really annoys me that you take chill teenagers and you put them under a, a system. Forcibly, you put them a system that is hierarchical. That is. Um, by the way, corrupted as well, that is uh, aggressive, that teaches them to be part of violence, that is not a natural thing for people. And also in the context of, of um, occupation of civilians, so it's not just a, a, a violence towards other soldiers, it's violence towards citizens or uh, civilians. So uh, I think you cannot expect that you put all these pressures on teenagers and then say, well, they're mental, they are fragile mentally. I, I don't accept this. There are external reasons that people also commit suicide. And, and this level of discussion doesn't at all exist in Israel. So Yeah, um, there are also external reasons why people are fragile maybe or, or have mental yeah, problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Guy. We have to close because the next um, uh, film is going to start and we have to make the change here. Um, I wish you, in uh, however this may be possible, um, a good premiere, a kind of safe room, safe premiere next week in, in Dokaviv. Thank you, Julian. Thank you for the festival for showing this film. I, I know and very well aware of all the sensitivities that you, in general, Germany has with uh, issues that are so sensitive to Israel. And I really respect and appreciate you showing this film. And, and I hope um, it resonates to the audience as well. Thank you very much. I'm sorry we couldn't go deeper there, but we would have needed an hour or so next time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.